Okay, uh, hello everyone, this is a live podcast. Uh, so, um, me and Matt have been interviewing people that have uh, the condition that we've suffered from, which is bipolar disorder, and we've both been on a ketogenic diet, which has given us significant improvement in our symptoms, and so we've been speaking to other people who've also experienced this. And uh, if you see our YouTube channel, you can see people, direct patient experiences, talking about how they've had remission of symptoms or significant improvements on ketogenic diet, and some of them are quite moving. Uh, stories. So I'll show a little bit of that tomorrow, uh, but you could also find us on YouTube on BipolarCast. Um, so this is a conversation with uh, Matt and Jan, who've both been on this ketogenic diet uh, journey together. And uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Jan. She is the president of Bazooki Group, a former Silicon Valley fintech marketing executive. Jan is a writer, parent, mental health advocate, and aspiring citizen scientist. She's the author of the national best-selling debut, A Small Indiscretion, which was a San Francisco Chronicle recommended book of 2015. Her essays have appeared in publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Writer's Digest. And her short fiction has received numerous awards, including an O. Henry Prize for the first published story that she put out. Jan holds an undergraduate degree from Stanford and an MFA from San Francisco State University. She's currently at work on a memoir about her son's recovery from bipolar disorder with a 100-year-old metabolic treatment for epilepsy. Jan is married to David Buzuki, the founder and CEO of Roblox. David and Jan have a son and three daughters and live in San Francisco Bay Area. Together, they co-founded the Buzuki Group to advance the family's philanthropic goals. Jan co-directs the strategy and runs day-to-day -day operations. Jan's particular passions include metabolic treatments for mental illness, regenerative approaches to food production and environmental conservation, and electoral initiatives that combine open primaries with instant runoff voting. Just a massive underachiever. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the <laughs> Matthew Bizuki is a multi-instrumentalist music musician and producer working with the music team at Roblox, a global platform where millions of people around the world gather and create an immersive, user-generated 3D worlds. He is also a gifted mathematician working at the intersection of creative and analytical thinking, studying courses in computer science at UC Berkeley and physics at Santa Clara University while producing and composing music. Having suffered from bipolar disorder and experiencing the life-changing benefits of a ketogenic diet as a metabolic approach to the illness, he works as a mental health advocate with the Buzuki Group. His work as an advocate and activist and his experience with metabolic therapy through ketogenic diet have played a central role in the Buzuki mission to move neurometabolic research to the forefront of brain science in order to transform clinical psychiatric care. He was a speaker at the Metabolic Health Summit Metabolic Psychiatry Group this year at Santa Barbara and has led many others with bipolar who are experiencing the benefits of metabolic therapy to come forward for the first time to the Bipolar Cast podcast. Today he joins us live from San Francisco Bay. Hello, Matt. Hi, Matt. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the first live audience broadcast. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> So, um, I won't read my bio. Uh, I do know that in one of the oldest versions of the program, it says that I'm the international CEO of several multinational corporations. This is definitely not the case. <laughs> uh, but I, I thought that sounded pretty cool, and my wife was quite happy to hear that. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Jan, could you tell us um, about your time in Paris and London, and what role did this play in beginning to write? What was the first motivation you had to begin journaling and writing? Oh boy, I haven't been asked this question probably since the paperback came out in 2016, so let me think for a minute. Um, well, I, when I was a sophomore at Stanford, I had been taking French for six years, so I applied for the Stanford in Paris program, thinking that that is what serious French students do. And then when I had the interview at Stanford, which was like 12 people sitting around the room talking to me in French, I realized my French was not very good at all. I didn't get into the program. So I went to Paris anyway, and then I lived in London for six months. And I guess that being alone during those times traveling was what really first got me in the habit of a daily writing routine. Um, so I, it was kind of two things. One was that that was where I started to 
write every day. And then secondly, when it came time to write a novel 20 years later, I had those experiences to kind of inform what I was writing about. So if you read the novel, which I'm not saying anyone needs to rush out and read the novel, but um, oh, I borrowed the setting mostly from my experience in Paris and London at that time. And that was a time, you know, before cell phones. So fortunately for me, I have four kids. I would hate it if they checked out for, you know, a year and I couldn't get in touch with them. But that's how it was for me. I was completely free and independent and no one could really get a hold of me. So it was a feeling of real liberation. But thank goodness Matt will never fully experience that <laughs> freedom. <laughs> You've always got some access to him no matter where he goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the way now. Um, so this led to your debut novel, which was called A Small Indiscretion. And this was a USA Today best-selling book and a San Francisco Chronicle recommended book of 2015. So how do you feel that the travels and journaling and the freedom from technology and all restraints played a role in the formation of these ideas? How did this life experience contribute to the success of the book compared to writing with modern technology and email and the constant stream of information? Well, it definitely gave me... Um I guess it gave me the, the time to, you know, imagine... Well, I'll contrast it to, for, for example, my life now, where I'm finding it very difficult to write. Um, w writing requires, you know, concentrated time away from all of that, and I have found that I need to synthetically create that in my day-to-day -day life in order to write at all, even though I have, you know, a lovely office in my house in San Francisco with a beautiful view of the city. I cannot write a word there. I have to go rent some other room in some other person's house in order to get away from the day-to-day -day life. Um, so I guess that traveling really afforded me that um, ability to be somewhere else where the day-to-day -day demands of your life aren't impinging. So when you were uh, going through um, having bipolar disorder, was journaling something that was helpful um, for you in that journey? Um, what role did journaling play when you were going through that journey? Well, I would say that when Matt first started to show symptoms of bipolar disorder, anything I wrote felt, any fiction I was writing felt honestly completely ridiculous and irrelevant um, because the drama that was in our lives was so much more important and meaningful. And so I guess the thing that was most helpful during that journey that I carried from the writing of a novel, which I, I guess the, the writing of a novel for me is not so much, um, it's really asking questions. It's really an investigative process where you have an idea or you have a question in your mind and then you're trying out things. Um, one of my favorite writers, uh, talks about how you end up having to write a 1,500-page novel in order to get to the 300-page novel. So I would say the metaphor for Matt and our family is that we had to try a lot of stuff to get to the right answer, to get to the, to the plot that was you know, the right plot for us. And so I think that that, that investigative uh, questioning or um, research aspect was what helped me during that journey, just ask different questions and try different things and, you know, not give up until the, the correct storyline finally emerged for us. I want to come back to that because there's a clear parallel to publishing there, isn't there? Um, so, I'll, to Matt, um, you recently began, uh, so Jan is very interested in writing and this was her passion and you have a similar creative passion for music. Um, and you recently began a very exciting new job in music. Uh, can you tell us what you're working on at the moment? I am working on the music product team here at Roblox. By the way, hello everyone from sunny California. <laughs> um, I'm working on the music product team and so uh, I basically get to build tools for musicians to come on this platform and do all kinds of fun stuff. It's a very cool job, very fast paced, very fun team, um, a lot of smart people. And um, yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of a big deal to me that I can show up and execute and be very functional at a job like this um, now that I've recovered more or less. Could you, could you have imagined yourself being able to do that job a, a year or two years ago? 
I couldn't have imagined myself being able to do it. I think it was always a hope that at some point in the future, I would recover enough that I would be able to handle a job that requires so much executive functioning and planning out tasks and organization and, you know, public speaking, um, all these different things, um, time management. But when I was going through the initial parts of the recovery after all of these psychotic episodes I had um, and, you know, coming off the benzodiazepine and just all of this chaotic stuff in my life, no, there's no way I would have been able to do this. Mm. It's, um, <clears throat> it's a constant problem for people with bipolar disorder holding down a job because when you go through these severe depressions, it just, you really can be away from work for a long time. And so it's really remarkable anyone with bipolar disorder holding down a job for a long period of time is great. Um, well, I think the statistics are pretty dismal in that regard. I think something like uh, we did a project with the Milken Institute a couple of years ago where they were looking at this because even sometimes people who are bipolar who are in recovery are in recovery, but they're not able to work. And I'm sure Georgia, you know, has seen this. It's a very challenging illness to treat and to live with. And um, so we're, yeah, super grateful that Matt's in this place now where he's kind of able to do anything. Music is um, a thing that draws many people with bipolar disorder. You have this kind of really unique uh, perspective on life and experience of life that's both very dark and also very light, and sometimes it's hard to communicate that through normal means, and, and so a lot of people with bipolar look to music, and a lot of um, famous musicians were bipolar. Um, what role does music play for you in understanding and communicating your experience of bipolar? Does it help you to make sense of it in some way? That's a good question. Um, for me, yeah, I mean, I listen to the a lot of the the chaos uh, and uh, the excitement of classical music, especially, and Beethoven and these composers who had bipolar disorder, and it resonates with me. And I like to play this music. And um, when I hear the um, the 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 play between minor and major keys, you know, I see the play between the the highs and the lows of the illness. Um, but music has been with me since I was. Six years old, you know, I mean, I was I just naturally gravitated to it when I was in first grade and there was a fellow student of mine who was playing. And I like I think I literally came to you, mom, and, and my dad and said, look, I want to learn how to play piano. Like Billy, um, like Billy. Yeah, my friend. Yeah, his name was Billy. And so now um, there's something um, exciting about composing and um, a, and a mania when. Um, you know, there's no sleep and just all of these ideas are flying. But I think at the end of the day, it's possible to maintain some of the, um, the, the creative instincts that come with having this illness, but not um, manifest the, the horrible parts of the illness. So I can still be a creative person who has like bipolar, so to speak, even if I'm also a functional member of society. Hmm. Does having bipolar, does it give you a neat perspective on um, famous musicians with bipolar? You often hear stories of Kanye West. And I remember at the Metabolic Health Summit, you, you launched the plan to get Kanye West on keto. So I'm all in. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Let's make it happen. I know. That's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest play for some um, marketing for the diet that you could get. <laughs> yeah. Kanye to on the diet. Um, I, I relate to Kanye a lot, actually. I think, you know, a lot of his behavior... Um, I also did crazy things when I was psychotic and it's just unfortunate that um, the treatment is so ambiguous for this illness and that there's a treatment that we have that could perhaps help so, so many people, which is the ketogenic diet, which um, still has not gained the recognition that we want. So that's why we're doing the pod podcast and everything. And I think if you get Kanye on the diet, man, <laughs> that would be... I'm working so, on it. That'd be like the biggest thing we could do. He won't return my calls. It's crazy. I'm, I'm working on it. Matt, you, we're, should, we're, you should get him to do a, a concert in Roblox, and then he'd have to, you know, yes. interact. And then okay, I'll work on that. I know we're talking. Okay. <laughs> um, so, we'll, so we're going to come back to music. Uh, I want to talk more about this. Um, but to, to ask Jan again, are, so were there any when you were journaling and writing a uh, small indiscretion? Was there any kind of um, was there any kind of influence on that process uh, on your journey with uh, writing the memoir with Matt, did the kind of process of writing and journaling and collecting ideas inform how you approached this writing this memoir? Because you've been collecting notes for a long time on this. 
Yeah, it was actually a really different process. Um, I had always been keeping a notebook, but I had to stop keeping a notebook when I wrote the novel because otherwise I'd just keep writing in my notebook um, and not write the novel. So I don't really have any journals from the... F well, t technically it took 10 years, but um, the hardcore writing part was probably five years. I didn't take a lot of notes about you know, our life, our family life. Um, so it was a, it's a different process now looking at the notes that I took, and it was kind of like the way it would go is, you know, we'd have something would happen, Matt would get hospitalized, or, um, you know, we'd see signs of mania, and I would get up really early in the morning, go off to Starbucks, and just dump it all out. I didn't think I was ever going to use that material. Um, but then when Matt got better in the last year or so, and we knew why, we knew that the only thing that had changed at that time was that he went on a ketogenic diet. It seemed like, first, it had a happy ending. Um, so that made me much more interesting, interested in going through those notes and finding, finding out whether there was a book I could try to pull together. And then the second thing is, you know, we've been talking about the power of anecdotal evidence, and I think those N of 1 stories are almost more persuasive sometimes than all the studies in the world, or at least they might, you know, persuade the powers that be that they ought to be investing in this kind of research. But I'll tell you one kind of strange thing, and Matt, I don't even know if you know this, I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but in the novel that I wrote, that I published in 2015, long before any, any signs of bipolar disorder, there's a bipolar character in the book, and I remember when I was doing the research and I was reading, oh, like, um, you know, rapid cycling, that, that sounds interesting. I cr create a character around rapid cycling bipolar disorder. And when I read that now, I mean, I didn't know anything about bipolar disorder. And so it was all just sort of, you know, author research. Um, and the other strange part of it is that that book is about a son becoming, actually gets in a car accident, um, becoming very, very ill, and the family kind of loses track of him for a while. So I thought it was and ends up at Stanford Hospital, where Matt went for after his first mania. It's kind of a strange yeah. thing that I wrote some of this into a novel, and then we ended up kind of having some of that in our life. Oh, I didn't realize that. Did you... Um, you were saying that when you were writing, you had to take a break uh, to help Matt with this, and it's obviously very hard to do that if this is your passion and your kind of life is writing and writing daily, and it must have taken a lot of commitment to take a break from that. And I, I notice with people with bipolar that the people who recover, including people at this conference I've met, tend to have extremely motivated and dedicated parents. And if they don't have that, they tend to do, I'd say it almost seems like one of the biggest predictors for how well they would do. But the parents have to be so motivated and committed to work through all the treatments that you might have to go through with bipolar and seeing a lot of them not working. And it's a very traumatic experience. Were there things in your early life and your travels that gave you that kind of drive and motivation to work through uh, all that comes with exploring treatment options with a child with bipolar? I mean, honestly, I think I'm, I'm just kind of an obsessive person. Matt will attest to that. <laughs> um, and as my mother said, actually, when Matt was born and I... Um, I had been working, you know, 80 hours a week at a financial software startup, and that had been my obsession. And then Matt was born, and I was like, oh, here's my new obsession. <laughs> and my mother said to me, yeah, you never really were very good at focusing on two things at once. And um, so, I mean, I did manage to, to write the book. Well, I, was, I, did, I did move my focus away from my kids eventually and, and uh, enough to write fiction. But I think when all of that happened. I kept trying to write, I kept trying to get back into the novel that I was writing then, and as I said, it just seemed, honestly, it seemed kind of pointless, and I couldn't do it, and I kept, then I kept feeling guilty, because every writer who's not working on the project they're supposed to be writing on feels guilty. Um, but I did, I'm glad that I just sort of gave into the impulse, which was to throw myself into learning about bipolar disorder, and kept these notes because I actually, it's like 1,400 pages of notes, way too much for one book. Um, and I never would have been able to recreate that and we would have lost that story that might be able to help other people. So I think it's kind of a lesson in, at some point you have to trust your instincts and do what feels the most important in the moment, even though 
and I, I had a couple of friends, writer friends, who kept writing right through their kids' uh, mental health crises, and I always was feeling like, why can't I do this? You know, why can't I do both things? Um, but I wasn't able to, and I certainly don't regret it because it, I think that hopefully what we will be, the story we'll be able to bring to the world, will be able to help lots and lots of people. When you were uh, writing your novel, obviously that you were saying the publishing process, you go through a lot of rejections from publishers as an early novelist. And well, your first book was actually published, so you must have battled through a lot of writing and uh, writing to editors. Um, do you feel there's a parallel between that and some of the things that you go through in the treatment programs with bipolar, just having to have the sheer persistence to get to what works? I mean, it's kind of like anything in life, right? It's like you just you just got to keep going. And actually, it wasn't what, by the time it came to Publish, f finding an agent and finding an, a publisher for my book, that, that part was not difficult. But when I decided I was going to start publishing short stories, somebody told me, and maybe this is a good way of looking at some struggles in life, somebody said, your job is not to get a story published because you, that is not under your control. Your job is to collect 100 rejection letters. So I'm like, okay, totally achievable goal. I'm gonna do this thing. <laughs> and I was nearly there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was sending out four different stories. I think I got to about 89 rejections before this one was finally published in the New England Review, and then it went on to win an O'Henry Prize, which is kind of a big deal for a writer. So, um, yeah, that's very similar, I guess, to the, jour the journey that we went through. I mean, I'm, I really did drag you through so much stuff, Matt. I mean, um, so many weird treatments and different doctors and, um, you know, RTMS for a week where Matt had to sit with a magnet pulsing on his scalp. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what that was like, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> um, it kind of worked to bring you out of the depression, I think, but it definitely wasn't a long-term uh, solution. And so we just kept trying. And I have to say that I was, you know, I think Matt and Dave, um, my husband, Matt's dad, the three of us were a pretty good team. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Matt, but I think we, we hung together pretty well. Um, yeah, you know, I'm really grateful to you, Mom, and to Dad, obviously, for just never giving up. I mean, we relentlessly tried, like, everything there was, you know, plethora of medications, many of which did not work for me or even gave me just hor horrific side effects. Um, Lots of psychiatrists, you know, psychiatry is very imprecise science. So lots of weird tapers and all this different business and treatment centers that, you know, didn't really help me. A lot of them didn't help me that much. Um, they didn't give me the structure that I needed. And um, uh, ultimately, like, it was up to me uh, to kind of put the pieces together and put the, the you know, a few healthy habits keto being probably the most important keto and exercise. I would say keto, uh, regular exercise and no drugs and alcohol and cigarettes, probably those three alone for a lot of people who have some sort of recurrent, um, mental illness. Like I, I think that will do a lot. It certainly did a lot for me. Um, and then getting the sleep on getting the sleep, on track and all this stuff and like steadily stacking kind of one habit on top of the other until it was, I had this program for life that made sense that I could adhere to. But yeah, I mean, we all really went through hell trying all these different treatments and it was a process where, you know, mom, we didn't, you didn't know the right thing. Like it was very unclear what the right medication was and what, you know, the right antipsychotic, all these things and where I should live and a lot of these lifestyle factors and how to incentivize me to take control of my own life. Um, it was very challenging. Um, I'm really grateful that now I can try to like, you know, inf inform people about this, this lifestyle change keto that literally transformed um, my life and, and my illness. And it basically gave me my, my life back and I can talk more about it in a little bit. bit. But yes, we did go through hell, and it was very difficult, but we made it through. Yeah, we did. So, um, just to briefly come back to uh, music, you were talking about uh, classical music and bipolar disorder. 
And um, there's been some interesting science around that. Uh, Johns Hopkins professor K. Redfield Jameson, who herself was bipolar, did this systematic analysis of the influence of manic and depressive episodes in a lot of creative people. And this included the role of composition in Schumann symphonies, Edgar Allan Poe's poetry and short stories, Vincent van Gogh's paintings, and Ernst Hemingway's, writing, Ernst Hemingway's writings. And she noted the repeated appearance of manic depression in many of the family histories of these people. Um, what is it about classical music that is so appealing to someone with bipolar disorder? And like you say, Beethoven and various composers were um, classical uh, composers. I don't want to overstate how much the bipolar illness itself is the driver of my love for music and classical music. Um, I, I do think I like, feel these emotions very intensely. Um, but I mean, it's, it's something that I have loved like with my whole heart, even far, far before this illness started to manifest. Um, does it give me like some sort of creative advantage? I don't know, actually, this is, I mean, you know, Kay has written a lot about this, so I'm not quite sure. Hmm. Um, she certainly, she certainly feels it, it, it did help her with creativity, but she also says that taking lithium really leveled her out enough to be productive. So it's, it, it is interesting. Um, that she wrote, I remember she wrote in uh, An Unquiet Mind that she couldn't read for years because they had her on such a high dose of lithium. And I just remember reading that this was years ago and I like could not believe it. It was horrible. Yeah, it's, um, she's an amazing person. She writes in a scientific way about her experience with uh, bipolar. Well, one thing I'll, I'll add something I remember you said to me, Matt, when you decided to major in music, you said, you know, I can do music when I'm manic, I can do music when I'm depressed, and I can do music when I'm fine. And I, I think that was, I can remember times when you were manic when you would play the piano for six or seven hours a day, and it was like this outlet that was kind of a safe home for you in whatever state you were in. And it was always very beautiful and comforting and Sometimes you probably don't know this, but I would stand at the top of the stairs and record it <laughs> oh my goodness. where you couldn't see me. Oh, we, no. had, we had to put a <laughs> piano in the basement because Matt played so much piano that like his three sisters would kind of like be, we need some quiet. So we had to put another piano in the basement so that he could play as many hours as he needed to without it filling the whole house. They Very were obsessive, a, obsessive, yeah. manic depressive, <laughs> you know, music <laughs> type stuff. <laughs> So um, going briefly back to traveling, um, you traveled through India and the Himalayas. Um, what made you look for these more difficult and risky journeys? Um, what made it worthwhile to travel to places like that instead of uh, easier or safer places? Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, um, I had been living in Australia. This is after I graduated from college. I was supposed to go be an investment banker, and then um, I decided I'm not good at math. I'm not very analytical. I got a C in accounting. Maybe I should go back to Hawaii and be a cocktail waitress. But then I couldn't get a job as a cocktail waitress because I didn't have any experience. Anyway, um, so I was traveling, living in Australia, and I was supposed to be with two friends. And we were going to go off to Southeast Asia, and neither one of them managed to save any money. And I had, like, I had only saved a couple thousand bucks, but it was enough. And um, so they went home. One went to England, one went back to Hawaii. And I went on this journey on my own for six months. Matt, don't ever do that and tell your mother that you're with friends. Um, she didn't find out I was alone until I got back. And I just sort of went, you know, where, where people um, told me to go. I did trek alone in the Himalayas for a couple of weeks and got very lost. I could get lost anywhere and it was especially easy in the Himalayas. Um, but that turned out to be useful because I did stick that in the novel. Okay. Did you ever come across yak butter tea when you were in the Himalayas? I'm sure I had yak you butter. <laughs> yeah, for sure there was some yak butter. So you were an early adopter of the keto uh, bulletproof coffee. Bull <laughs> bulletproof coffee, yeah. <laughs> the, um, did it kind of make you think of different dietary approaches, traveling and seeing so many different... Uh, did it kind of make you more aware of things, alternatives to the modern Western diet, or was it just something? No, definitely yeah. not. I had a terrible <laughs> diet, and I, I, had a, I did not establish what I now know to be what would have been good habits. And in fact, Matt, I don't know if you remember this, but when you had some anxiety uh, that fall quarter of junior year, and Matt made a decision that he was going to 
figure out how to get out of this, taught himself to meditate. Um, read a, he read a book called Mark Hyman's The Ultramind Solution. And that's the person who gave me that book, and that's the book that launched me into this revelation that, oh my God, this diet that I've been feeding my kids of, or, and that I've been eating, you know, Raisin Bran and low-fat milk, we're not doing that anymore. We're going to switch this up. So um, I, did, I didn't have any good ideas about diet until I started looking at getting into functional medicine. And then when I read uh, Nina Teichholz's The Big Fat Surprise, that was when everything changed in our household. <laughs> and um, much to my daughter's chagrin, so, um, Mike, could you describe uh, what the ketogenic diet did for you? Um, what was the difference between trying keto and trying all the traditional medications and programs that you've been on? Um, could you describe your experience when you first went on it? So I went on the diet January 3rd of 2021, which was last year. Prior to that, I went through the equinox of 2020, which is in March which is when the days are getting longer and longer and longer very rapidly. That's the second derivative for you math people. And I had to take 20 milligrams of Zyprexa, sometimes more. And I'd become like very in touch with this, you know, watch tracking my sleep, watching go down and down, watching my energy rise as my sleep was decreasing. And then having to take additional Zyprexa, olanzapine to bring myself back. So I was taking 20 or more. And then I went on keto the following year in January. And then I went through the next equinox, which was the equinox of last year, 2021. And I was basically on five milligrams through the whole thing. I was on 25% of what I had been the previous year. My sleep was not decreasing. My sleep was like eight hours, eight hours, eight hours. And I was tracking it every night. And my mood was consistent. I wasn't embarrassing myself in front of my friends in public doing weird things that are like you know, a little bit hypomanic. It was remarkable. Uh, my, my energy was better. So I had these effects on my mood, just on the illness per se, but then my energy was better and I was felt strong in the gym and swimming and all these things. And my sleep was great. Then it literally transformed my life. And I had the biggest thing for me was prior to going on this diet, I was obsessed with trying to keep my mood stable because the momentum of my illness into hypomanic and manic episodes and previously psychotic episodes over the last few years was so intense that I literally had to spend all of my waking hours trying to manage my mood and keeping it stable as medita uh, medication changes, you know, coming off benzo, Valium, all this stuff. When I went on keto, I started to actually focus on my life. So I started thinking about things in my life and the transition happened gradually. So I wasn't thinking about this meds as much. And as I started to put together weeks and months of con consistent sleep on a consistent medication schedule, I started thinking about work and friends and, you know, normal twenties, you know, guy in his twenties things. Um, so yeah, it was like remarkable, Ian. I mean, we've talked about it at length, but for me, it's the closest thing to a panacea that I have ever found for this illness. That's amazing. If you could, uh, you went through so many different treatment programs, if you could design a treatment program that took into account these metabolic factors, what would it be like if you had a friend that was just diagnosed with bipolar and you wanted them to have a different experience to what you had? What, what, how do you imagine a treatment center and what kind of programs would they have and, and the food and the light and the exercise, things like this? This is my favorite question because you know, my mom and I have been literally talking for years about designing a treatment center that does it correctly because of so many of them failed me, to be honest. Um, so this is my, my vision would be you manage the light, you manage the light exposure, you manage the sleep, you manage the physical exercise, you manage the keto and have someone working on the meds who's really good, who also understands the lifestyle changes that are going on in the other areas of the life. So, I mean, like waking up, early, you know, waking up and getting sunlight first thing in the morning and then wearing the blue light blockers before bed and getting to bed at a reasonable hour. I mean, I do that every night, you know, that's like part of my ritual, the blue light blockers. Um, it proven an effective anti-manic for bipolar disorder and literally a mood stabilizer. Exercise, physical exercise, hard cardio, hard cardio, 
that's like for me. And then, uh, you know, eating keto and maybe, maybe meditating. I mean, I literally think if you did that, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that if you did that, you could get much better in a lot of cases, depending on the nature of the illness. Now, is it easy to get up and get hard cardio when you're in a horrible, you know, depression? That's not easy, obviously, because there's a literally an energy dysfunction in your body. And that's just pushing you, making you lethargic. Like I understand that. So that's the biggest challenge. I think just taking simple steps, like getting outside in a depression, just getting outside and getting sunlight, getting some sun exposure during the day. Um, so yeah, it's challenging, but to answer your question, Ian, those are some of the lifestyle things I would put in place and then have really good psychiatrists. And, you know, I mean, I would love to see that for people who are like motivated to get better. I would love to see something like that um, come to fruition. I'm just thinking you would love this conference because yeah, the no. way, the way <laughs> you almost just described this conference, the way Josephine set up, there's Pilates first thing in the morning. I wish I was there. Bright I wish light I exposure, like everything is designed around all the things. All the meals are keto. It's the first time I've ever been in a hotel and they said, do you want all your meals to be keto? I's like, yes. Well, Matt, you would love it. Strawberries and cream for <laughs> snack. And oh, can you show everyone, this is a family tattoo. All four of my kids have this tattoo that they designed for themselves and... My sisters came to me and were very proactive about it, my younger sisters. So I wasn't going to push because it was their first tattoo. So I said, look, if you guys are going to be proactive, come to me, then we can do it. And they did it. <laughs> so I said, okay. Well, the, uh, they were suggesting that when you were Charlotte's age, so our youngest is 18, the rule was if you ever get a tattoo, like we're not paying for college or something, and then she turned 18 and went and got a tattoo and it was like, you know... <laughs> Pick your battles. <laughs> Fourth child. I kind, of, I kind of had to break in a lot of this stuff as the eldest child, which yeah. is kind of my responsibility to break it in with the parents so that my sisters can get away with it. Yeah. Paving the way. <laughs> so true. So true. So, I mean, um, what was your experience like with the existing bipolar treatment programs and, and how are they different to the ways that you see other serious conditions approach, like, say, cancer, for example? I, well, I mean, there's this thing people call stigma that a lot of people will feel that I, I actually never felt it like too much. If I'm being honest, um, I, I was never, I think I was never affected by this, this idea about stigma, the way a lot of people were, um, in that I wanted to conquer the illness and live a life where I was employable and I was functional in a way that even if I told people, look, I have bipolar illness, Oh, but he's, he's crushing it. So, you know, we don't care as for how it's different in the treatment. It's very, I went to a lot of treatment centers where either the diet was really bad. And like, even in the psych wards, it's like the, the fridges are full of root beer, you know, it's not, it's just, it's, it's terrible. Or there wasn't enough discipline or structure or community. Um, so those are all things that I would want to build into a treatment center my own if I were going to build one. Also, this illness, the nature of, of re the recovery is such that going to treatment centers and being in the hospital, people don't come and gather around you like when you have cancer. Now, obviously, cancer is, is a terrible thing, um, but, but I just want to like illustrate the difference. It's lonely. The recovery is lonely. The suffering is lonely and, um, and it's, you know, people don't understand. So I would say that was the main difference I saw. And that was what was so hard for me was getting cut off from my friends. My friends were on this trajectory, finishing college in four or five years, going and getting a job, doing internships in the summer, you know, social relationships in a social circle, four years of consistent college at the same place. I was just taken out and moved around, you know, not of my own volition. And I couldn't build that. And I'm still, that still frustrates, frustrates me today. Sometimes luckily I've like been able to get things back on track and I, I have those things in place now in my life. But um, that was a point of huge frustration for me for a long time and something that was very difficult. Thank you for sharing that. The, 
How do you, um, what kind of tools and treatments would you like to see be made available, Jan, if there was better clinics that take into account the metabolic approach in the future? I mean, yeah, we have this vision of, that's it's kind of what Josephine is describing, you know, um, and we do it in the Swiss Alps, maybe, um, where a person comes and um, first is put on a ketogenic diet um, and in a way where we have psychiatrists, maybe Georgia wants to come and do this, um, who are, you know, who can, who understand what the transition is going to be like. I mean, one of the things we were concerned about, Dr. Chris Palmer so kindly uh, stepped up to manage Matt's care um, pro bono. And one of the things that he warned us is that in the transition into ketosis, some bipolar patients really struggle because I guess they can become manic. Um, and so, I mean, there was even the suggestion that we didn't, that we shouldn't do it in January, that we should wait until June, where, which is more of a depressive cycle. And Matt was like raring to go. And I was just like, we can't go through another six months. We cannot go through another March Madness. And so we just took the risk and did it. And um, I think you had two days where you had to take extra Zyprex and maybe an extra 2.5 or something to manage some insomnia, and that was it. Um, and so I think the, the risks have to be managed, but the risks should not keep anyone from trying this. You know, don't try it at home. Get someone like Dr. Palmer or Georgia or all the people that they are training. Um, but don't delay also. Um, and I guess I want to be able to have a place like that where I knew I could send the families that come to me and know that they were going to take all this into account. And, you know, Matt has a meditation routine, the sunlight in the morning, the blue light blocking glasses, um, the exercise, the community. And Matt, I'll let you speak to the art therapy. Oh, the art therapy. Yeah, this is this funny joke I make about how the psych wards and the treatment centers are focusing on the 90% of interventions that are result or cause 10% of the um, results in how much better you feel. So this is the Pareto principle. So there are a few key things, the things that I've laid out and they're pushing the things that don't make a hardcore physiological impact on your system. So I have no doubt that art therapy can be valuable or other things like that, but that's not the driver. I, in my opinion, in my experience, you need to impact the physiology, physiology of the body, give it new fuel, expose it to new light and get the heart rate and just, mm, just shock the system. Yeah. And they don't want to do that. So I don't know. It just drives me crazy. So anyway, that's my rant. I'm done. There's, a, <laughs> there's, there's someone else. Is, is, is on but how do you really is, feel? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable how frustrating it can be for people with bipolar in these things. And, and there's an, an Indian author called Srivatsa Nevatiya who wrote this uh, travel memoir. And he was traveling through India and he was uh, being hospitalized into these treatment centers. And he just describes what a disempowering and kind of shameful experience it was for him to be have all of his power taken away from him and to be treated like a, a child. And, and obviously there's fantastic facilities and, and wonderful doctors who really help people. But sometimes, especially in other countries outside of the Western world, it can be a very demeaning experience to suffer from bipolar and go through treatment. Um, I wonder, why do you think bipolar is like this? Why, how, why do you think it's treated in this way that's so different to cancer where everyone would understand, you'd probably go into work and everyone would bring you a cake and say, I'm so sorry and make every accommodation. Why is bipolar so different that, it, that it's not treated in a kind of more systematic way and recognized by people? I mean, I think it's not just bipolar, right? It's probably schizophrenia is much worse, schizoaffective disorder, um, major depression, anxiety. People, people don't want to talk about it. So I think stigma is a big part of it, but um, it's not something that we ever, I think, really bought into as a family. It's kind of like, if you don't believe in stigma, it, it can't really touch you. And uh, I was lucky because Matt was always very open about talking about it. And so that enabled us to be open about talking about it. And I don't think there has, I almost don't think there has ever been a time when I didn't share our story that I didn't get some kind of story back. And so 
you know, we need to crush stigma by just talking about it. Um, and by doing the neuroscience to demonstrate that this is a metabolic problem in the brain. This is not a... And, and Matt it was always so funny because he would say to me, after some happened, you know, after some kind of upset, he would say, this is not a psychological problem. Like, do you understand? My life is fine. This is a brain problem. So his, his understanding, acknowledgement of that was always very helpful. I think it's kind of odd that we're always trying to address this from a psychological perspective. It, I remember somebody saying to me, a very well-meaning um, family member saying, you know this isn't your fault. And I felt like saying, you know, if he had cancer, you wouldn't say that. And the reason you're telling me that it's not my fault is because you're thinking it's my fault. And we know that it's not my fault. Why would it be my fault any more than if you had cancer? I mean, it could be that I fed you the wrong foods. That could be the case. But they're meaning it in a psychological way. Um, and so I think stigma is one. But I think the biggest thing, honestly, is we don't understand these... We don't understand what causes these disorders and therefore we lump them into the you know, psychological realm because we don't understand what's happening in the brain. And epilepsy used to be considered uh, uh, you know, psychological or it used to be considered insanity. But once we understood something about what was happening in the brain, once you could put an EEG on there and I guess see the, see the seizures, then suddenly it's, it's neurology. It gets moved over from psychiatry, which is this, this poor cousin, over to the... Um, Neuro neurology department, which is considered to be much more science. So I, I think we have to come at it from two directions. One is to bash stigma by just barreling ahead and telling stories and encouraging other people to tell their stories and then uh, furthering the science so that people understand this is a brain disorder. This is a brain-based condition. This is not t having to do with your childhood. Or maybe that's just me wanting to, you know, get off the hook. But. I think also people would be quite afraid to give a stigma to Matt. He's like six foot four and, and quite ripped. He, they might get bashed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they might get bashed before he does. He, um, what um, practical tips and manageable first steps would you recommend for a family who are facing the daunting train of beginning to explore treatment for someone in their family? This is such a hard question because I face this a lot because people will call me and ask, uh, you know, what what to do um, and just to describe, it's usually a child in crisis. Matt often will speak with the child, if it's usually a young adult, actually, um, if they're willing. Um, and I think that's probably the most helpful thing. Actually, I've been sharing your video, Matt, and of anything, I think that's probably the best thing I could share because it's, an, it's uh, the first podcast, um, episode one. They can see the evidence of your recovery. Um, but... I mean, my advice to parents is usually, this isn't going to sound great, but don't believe what you're told. You know, don't believe this message that um, this is a chemical imbalance in the brain and it can be fixed with these medications, which your loved one is going to be on for the rest of their lives, and this is the best medication. Um, or these three medications are the best medications, and then, you know, you go on your way. Um, I think parents need to become experts. The loved ones need to become experts. We, we cannot rely on psychiatry as a profession to uh, bring the person back. And, I th and also, like I tell people, you're the expert on your kid. You know what your kid is like, and no one else does. And so you have to fight that battle until you see them fully, fully recovered. And even better, because you know now Matt has compassion and empathy and, and humility and all the things that come from having suffered. So um, it wasn't like it was a detour and, and now we're back on the old trajectory. We're on a new path that has been enriched in a way by this, by this journey. And hopefully we can use that to help other people. When you were in these um, really deep mood states, Matt, did, did the sort of neurotransmitter explanation seem enough to you? Did it seem like that, like just an imbalance of neurotransmitters could make sense of what you were experiencing, or was it something more extreme than that? Did it feel like something more extreme? I had a, I had a, a couple years from basically 2016 to 2018 where I don't, I don't think I was really well enough to even um, put together some thesis like that because I was in and out of psychosis and then in and out of the hospital in these treatment centers. I don't think I ever 
actually came down back to baseline. So it was more or less going into psychosis and then coming on down into some moderate mania. I mean, you know, I, I'm not quite sure because I, I don't remember all of those years very well, but this is what my mom has told me. However, to answer your question, after that, I was absolutely, as I um, mulled over it more and more, I was became absolutely convinced that this was not some sort of psychological problem. And like Jan said, this was not some sort of, especially after I started keto, this was sort of some chemical imbalance that medications were going to permanently fix. They were more or less masking the symptoms, if anything. And the symptoms just wanted to come out. Um, furthermore, I don't think it was some kind of personality defect at all. And I think that's a terrible, um, terrible theory if anyone, you know, um, believes in that type of thing. So, and I, 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 I the, my personal opinion, this was not because of any sort of family trauma or something like that, because I had a, like, I was lucky. I had a very nice upbringing with a couple of very nice parents in the suburbs. Like it was all very nice. The more I kind of thought about it. And especially when I went in keto, the more it became clear to me that I, it just was a pure problem with the energy and the way my energy and my mitochondria and the metabolic system. And that's it. That was, was what's calling this. That, that's what was causing the symptoms. That's what was causing the illness. It had nothing to do with me as a person, nothing to do with my personality, nothing to do with any of that. And I internalized that. And then it became very helpful because then I felt confident in myself that I could still deliver and function as a normal person after I had fixed up the metabolic, pro metabolic problem mm -hmm. by eating keto for however long. Did you find doing keto to be quite a solitary journey? Uh, because yes. uh, yeah, a lot. So hard. Oh, I, especially because I don't, dr you know, I don't drink alcohol or do, or do drugs. Like it's lonely, man. It's really hard. Um, girlfriend will eat like pizza and drink beer. And I'm just like, it kills me. It still kills me. Yeah. Um, but I got to do it. You know, I got to do it. Yeah. So I do it. <laughs> but yeah. How, it's very hard. Yeah. How it's do you do it? I mean, how, is. how do you find the discipline to, to do it? This is something I've always I don't know, mom. By. I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just do it. <laughs> I, I, the discipline is like, I, I remember that I was used to like be in these psych wards and run around homeless and like, I don't want to do that anymore. So that's where I get the discipline. <laughs> yeah. So we just have a, a few more questions um, before we wrap up. But um, I guess um, what I want to ask is, uh, Stephen Fry once said about his bipolar disorder, it's not all bad, heightened self-consciousness, apartness and an inability to join in physical shame and self-loathing. They're not all bad. Those devils have been my angels. Without them, I never would have disappeared into language, literature, the mind, laughter, and all the mad intensities that made and unmade me. Do you feel overall uh, in suffering from bipolar disorder that you regret having this uh, condition and you wish that you never would have had it? No, 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 no. I'm actually so grateful now. Um, yeah, I, I feel like, I feel very different as a person from when I was you know, 18, 19, before all this happened. Um, the best part is the opportunity to be useful now to other people who have these illnesses. Like it's, I was given a very clear purpose of how I can make a difference in the world. And that is like um, worth more than anything because I didn't really have that when I was in high school, late in high school. And now it was given to me and it's something I can do. Um, so that's really important. Also, just, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, I have a little bit of resiliency now. I can kind of tackle whatever is going to happen to me in my life. And that's a good feeling to have. That's fantastic. Yeah. I think it was uh, <clears throat> Victor Frankl said, suffering ceases to be suffering somehow when it finds a meaning. And it feels like that in your case, uh, that some, some of the healing journey is through being able to help other people because it, it helps with your own uh, recovery from it. Um, so uh, Jan, your journey has led from working as a waitress and a typist to adventuring through India and the Himalayas, becoming an award-winning author and now the president of a large philanthropic organization. And you have global teams driving systematic change across multiple domains, psychiatry, neuroscience, metabolic health. And you're also working in democracy, environmental conservation, and community well-being. 
So you have so many things that you want to make an impact on the world on, and uh, what advice would you give to people like yourself who want to improve the world and want to realize it through practical hard work like you've done? Well, first I should say you make it sound all very official. It's, it's <laughs> mostly just Carolyn and me, you know, talking <laughs> to people, <laughs> trying, to, trying to change a few things where we can. Um, but, I mean, honestly, I wish I'd taken a little bit of a break after Matt got better before launching into all this, but it was already kind of already going, so we didn't really just kind of kept, kept rolling. Um, um, I guess my advice for philanthropists, which is a word that I resisted for a really long time because it sounds so hoity-toity, but there's an advocate, maybe advocate, um, but my, yeah, my advice is if you have resources, I think if I didn't know about bipolar disorder and I was trying to fund science in bipolar disorder, I would literally be flushing the money down the toilet because I would have no idea. So I think, I, I think finding the thing where you know enough to really make a difference, to have an intuitive sense of what's the right direction here, is the absolute critical thing. And people, people are motivated by their personal life histories, and I think that if you allow that to be the driver of the good you want to do in the world, I mean, I'm sure Matt doesn't want to go and you know, necessarily work in a cancer ward where he doesn't understand what the person has really gone through. Um, there's the wounded healer, I think, works best when you really, really, truly understand just exactly what a person has gone through. And I think that's why Bipolar Cast is so valuable, because the people you're interviewing know that you have been exactly where they have been. And that makes a big difference. So, yeah, my advice is to find something you know a lot about, and you have a really good sense of how you can make a difference, and then throw your energies into that. Thank you. That is uh, the end of Bipolar Cast Live from uh, Switzerland. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thanks, and Matt. <laughs>